So we are so fortunate today to have Admiral William H. McRaven with us. It is a real honor and privilege, Bill, to have you here. I'm so grateful for my friend, General David Petraeus, for putting us together. Um, and, and, you know, how, just how quickly you immediately, you know, said, absolutely, what do you need? Um, and I think that just goes to speak to you as a person. Um, if possible, Bill, I'd love to just introduce you first. Um, thank everyone for, uh, for coming today, obviously. Uh, we're very fortunate. We've got a lot of special guests here today that, that um, you know, that give to uh, veterans and that, um, you know, really have veterans at, at you know, in the, in the front of mind. Um, a and M. We certainly at Mays Business School, in particular, we're very veteran friendly. M me in particular, my dad is a you know a retired Air Force guy, twenty three plus years. Um, we thank you, obviously, Bill, and all the veterans on today for all of your service. Um, you know, we we owe you <coughs> gratitude. William H. McRaven. Retired U.S. Navy four-star admiral and the former chancellor of the University of Texas system. During his time in the military, he commanded special operations forces at every level, eventually taking charge of the U.S. Special Operations Command. His career included combat during uh, Desert Storm and both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Recognized national authority on U.S. foreign policy and has advised Presidents George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and other U.S. leaders on defense issues. He currently serves on the Council on Foreign Affairs and the National Football Foundation. While Chancellor of the UT system, he led one of the nation's largest and most respected systems of higher education. Admiral McRaven graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a degree in journalism and received his master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. While a student at UT Austin, he met his wife, Georgianne, who I might add is very friendly and very nice. She was very, very gracious throughout this whole process of getting uh, Bill on. Uh, while she was also a student there, and they have three grown children. McRaven stays active with his writing, speaking, and board commitments. He's also the author, as Bill Muldoon said, of Make Your Bed, a very famous book. I know most of you have heard and know it well, and I'm sure have read. If not, I highly encourage you buy it, as well as Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations, as well as Special Operations Case Studies among some of the books that Bill has written. We are so fortunate, Bill, to have you here. Um, before I get right into it, I wanted to ask you, you know, is there anything you'd like to say? And welcome so much to Mays Business School, Texas A&M University. Well, thanks, Richard. Uh, appreciate it. Great to be here with you all at, uh, at Mays. And, and I'll start off by saying Giga Maggie's. Uh, you know, when I was overseas, uh, I, I told folks, particularly when I came back to Texas after retiring from the military, uh, I said, you know, when you're away from Texas, it isn't about the fact that you went to UT or A&M or one of the other schools. It's the fact that you were from Texas, that you have these Texas roots. And uh, and some of the best officers I had and some of the best friends I had in the service uh, were great Aggies. And, uh, and I am, I'm thrilled and honored to be here today to, to spend a little time with you folks. So thanks. Very great. Thank you so much. And I just wanted just to let you know a little bit about the interview that we're going to do today. Per Bill's request, we're going to um, interview him. And then, of course, uh, we'll open it up to Q&A. He told me that there's not a hard stop at one, but we can maybe go a little bit past if, if necessary. Um, and I broke this interview down so that we first we get to know him a little bit better and then we can get into the meat of the interview, which is the topic of leadership from the battle uh, field to the boardroom and then we'll end it with a little something extra. Okay, so getting to know you, Bill, uh, our mutual friend General David Petraeus describes you as an extraordinary shipmate in Iraq and Afghanistan and a truly inspirational leader, speaker, and human being. He is truly a national asset. When one thinks of Admiral McRaven, these are some of the adjectives that would most definitely come to mind. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about yourself that most people don't know about you, and what's your typical day like? Yeah, well, first, I, I appreciate the, the nice words from Dave Petraeus. Uh, as General Petraeus, uh, 
and I have figured out over the, over the years, I think I served with him more than any of his army officers did because we, we served together in Iraq, we served together when he was the CENTCOM commander, and then we served together when he was in Afghanistan. So uh, he just couldn't shake this old Navy guy and, uh, and, and Dave and I have become very good friends uh, after, certainly after we both retired, but even during our, our time in the service. And he is a phenomenal guy. And I, I know he's had a chance to talk to Mays before and, uh, and I'm sure that was uh, extremely valuable uh, to your students um, and alumni. So, uh, you know, what about me that, that you don't know? I mean, I, I'm a big basketball fan. So uh, even at the, the ripe old age of 64, I like to get out on the courts and, uh, and bang around with the kids. Haven't been able to do that obviously since COVID, uh, but I've got a net out in front of my house and I, I, I still keep my, uh, you know, my hook shot uh, in form. It's about all I've got. Uh, you know, when, when you have a two inch vertical leap, it's a little hard to, to take on the young kids. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm a big sports guy and, uh, and I'm a big reader. You're sitting here in, in, uh, in my library, or I'm sitting here in my library, and, uh, and I, uh, I just have this kind of fascination with books. I like hard books, although, although I am a Kindle guy, I've become a Kindle guy, I still can't do without the, the, the feel of a good book. Great. Um, well, so I'm curious, uh, you know, you are someone that so many young people look up to. Um, and you're a role model for so many. I'd like to know, Bill, and I'm sure many of our participants would like to know, who was a role model for you growing up? Well, you know, I, I was really fortunate. I had two fabulous parents. Uh, my father was a, uh, an Air Force officer, World War II fighter pilot. Uh, he flew Spitfires during the war uh, because uh, when the Americans first got in the war, we didn't have a plane that could match the, the Messerschmitt. And so the Brits loaned us Spitfires with their Rolls-Royce engines. My dad used to love to talk about how powerful the Rolls-Royce engines were. Uh, so for two years uh, during the war, he flew cross-channel missions, uh, supporting the bomber missions into Germany, and then down to North Africa, and then to, uh, then to Italy. Um, and my mother was an East Texas school teacher. She was raised in Grapeland, Texas. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, they have these, uh, you know, kind of greatest generation values. And, uh, and, and I grew up with that, I mean, my mother, uh, expected me to work hard. She expected me to be honest. Uh, my father was big on respect and humility. Uh, so, you know, you know, when you are raised uh, in this environment, I think it, uh, it serves you well, you know, wherever you go from there. So when I look back at the, the people that really shaped uh, my character, I mean, it started with my parents, but I was fortunate also to, uh, I went to school in San Antonio, uh, had some great teachers there, and then, then off to UT. And then, of course, my time in the military, you know, you're fortunate to be around remarkable men and women who kind of inspire you every day. And it's not just the, it's not just the great officers, it's the remarkable enlisted men and women. Uh, and, and when you see them and you see their sacrifice, uh, you see their, their work ethic, their sense of duty, you know, it's hard not to be inspired. Fantastic. Bill, you've done so much in your life from being a four-star admiral in the Navy uh, leading special operations at every level, commanding troops in Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, to being the chancellor of the University of Texas system and advising U.S. presidents on defense issues. What would you say has been your most challenging role and your most rewarding role? Yeah, I think they are one and the same. Uh, you know, when you are when you are in combat, and I spent uh, kind of six years in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, when you're in combat, it is incredibly challenging. You're making decisions every day, frankly, just about every hour of every day uh, that affect the lives of the men and women that, uh, that work for you, uh, that affect the lives of the people you're trying to help. Uh, and, and so the, the pressure and the challenges of making the right decisions uh, is, uh, again, it is incredibly challenging, but it's also incredibly rewarding when you make those decisions correctly. Um, again, you're going to have tough times. You're not going to get it right all the time. You're going to fail uh, periodically. And, uh, and you hope at the end of the day, of course, the ledger shows that you had more successes than you had failures. But, but again, being away from, uh, from your family, uh, you know, is, is tough. Uh, but it is also, again, rewarding to be with the, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and, and civilians that are out there uh, helping with the war effort. So great challenges, but also great rewards. 
Excellent. All right, let's get right into it. Leadership from the battlefield to the boardroom. Bill, what do you believe is the most important characteristic or trait leaders should have, whether they are leading on the battlefield or in the boardroom? Yeah, you know, in the military, we, we have this uh, reference to a, a servant leader. Uh, the expectation that as a leader, you understand that it's not about you. If you ever think it's about you, if you think it's about your ego and your success, you're probably not going to be the leader or you're not the leader uh, that the team needs. And, you know, leadership in, in the simplest of terms is really just, you know, you have a mission to accomplish and the leader's got to inspire, motivate, and manage the people that work for them to accomplish that mission. The harder the mission, the harder the task, the better a leader you have to be. Um, but this idea of servant leadership, I think, encompasses a lot. It's a recognition that as the servant leader, your responsibility is to the people that work for you. And by that, I, I, that doesn't mean that, you know, you give them every Friday off. That means that what you do is you set a high standard, you give them the tools and the resources to achieve uh, those standards, and then you hold them accountable. Uh, and, and these are kind of the three fundamentals, I think, of, you know, management and leadership is set a high standard, make sure you understand what that standard is, make sure you communicate that standard to the people that work for you, give them the resources. And by the resources, I mean, not just the tools, but the latitude to do the job. Uh, because sometimes uh, as a leader, you are reluctant. I would, I would even offer you're afraid to give too much responsibility to the junior people that work for you, because you know that your reputation depends on their, uh, their completing the task, their excellence. So if you're not able to give them the latitude, then you're probably, again, not being the servant leader you need to be. But at the same time, you have to hold them accountable. Leadership is a lot about accountability. Um, you know, I have found in, a, in my time, certainly in combat, uh, if you don't hold people accountable, then those people that are working hard to do the right thing, they begin to lose hope that, you know, what's the point of us working hard? What's the point of us busting our hump? if you know, some slacker is out there not working as hard and not being held accountable for their mistakes, their lack of effort, et cetera. Um, there's a, a great saying from uh, Pope Francis, and he says, a shepherd should smell like his sheep. I love that. A shepherd should smell like his sheep. I think this is the other part of servant leadership and understanding that you have to be down with the troops. You have to be down with your employees. You have to understand the implications of your decisions on the men and women that work for you. And the only way you're gonna understand the impact of your decisions is if you're, if you're on the ground, you're walking around, you're listening to them, you know, you're able to understand that every time you say something, every time you do something, that has a ripple effect down to the, the very deck plates uh, of the ship, if you will, and, the, and to the privates in the foxhole and to the lowest employee in, in a corporation. Uh, so that, that kind of, uh, again, this idea of servant leadership encompasses a lot. Wow, that's, that's excellent. I, I love that. I love the saying, too. Um, okay, what's the number one thing that kept you up at night as it related to your leadership of your troops in wartime? Yeah, you know, you're always wondering whether or not, you know, you made the right decision. Uh, and sometimes... You know, frequently in the course of uh, my daily routine, if you will, uh, when I was in combat, um, you, we, we actually worked on what was called Zulu time, so Greenwich Mean Time, because again, the forces I was commanding were global forces. So we needed to have one time. So when we said, okay, it's going to be 1400, 1400 Zulu, everybody understood that was uh, 1400. And whether you were in Kazakhstan, whether you were in, uh, you know, in, uh, at Fort Bragg or whether you were in California, everybody understood the time. But that meant that we were on many times in Afghanistan, we were on a night cycle. So your day would be, uh, you know, I generally wake up almost about noon, but then you go to four or five in the morning. And then I, I, would, I would go to sleep at night, sometimes before the missions were completed. My job as a, as a senior officer, you know, I would approve the missions. Uh, I would generally watch the missions, but if they were kind of routine missions at some point in time, you know, you say, okay, I can't stay up all night because I've got to get up and, and get going the next morning because I've got senior officers I've got to talk to and those sort of things. I mean, if it was an important mission, a big hostage rescue, a big raid, you stay up through it. But when I would go to bed at night, I would ask myself, okay, 
Have I crossed all the T's? Have I dotted all the I's? Have I understood the risk of the missions that I am sending these soldiers out on? You know, and, and so as, as, I would, as I would lie in bed, of course, all this is going round and round and round, and, and you begin to you know, question yourself, did I do everything right? Uh, did I make all the right decisions so that my troops have the best chance of being successful on the battlefield? Uh, and if you did that, then you can sleep well at night. And if you didn't, then you're, you're, you're up a lot of the night and, and that becomes challenging. Wow. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the world just how important good leadership is and how catastrophic it can be when you have poor leadership. In your opinion, what government and business leaders have shined during this very challenging and unprecedented period in our history? And what do you think has made them stand out? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, from the government official standpoint, Tony Fauci, Dr. Tony Fauci, uh, clearly kind of stands above the rest. And I think what makes him stand out is the fact that, uh, you know, you have this immediate sense of professionalism. Uh, he has a calmness about him. Uh, he has a rigor in his thought process. Uh, you know, he is, I think, 79 years old, but, uh, but incredibly fit. So, so I think you, the American people have this confidence in Tony Fauci. Um, and, and America needs that confidence right now. They need to know that there is somebody uh, who, who really kind of understands the three-dimensional chess that we're playing here uh, and can play it as well as the virus can if we'll just follow the, the guidance of a Tony Fauci. Um, I think on the business side, you know, I've actually been impressed with Bill Gates. And, and I would offer that, uh, that Gates has done a lot of the same sorts of things from the standpoint of he is certainly advocating that we follow the data, that we follow science. But Gates, as he always does, you know, puts his money where his mouth is. Uh, so he is investing in everything from vaccines, uh, you know, to therapeutics, to, you know, helping where he can, where the underprivileged are being affected uh, by, by the coronavirus. So, you know, you, you see these, uh, I think, these two great individuals in terms of the federal government, Tony Fauci. And again, it just kind of comes to mind. But in the corporate world, Bill Gates uh, seems to, to shine, in my opinion. Okay, fantastic. Um your amazing book, Make Your Bed, talks about the little things that can change your life and maybe the world. Can you please talk about the last thing on that list, don't ever, ever ring the bell, and how the idea of never quitting should be applied to leadership in an organization? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, get, I get young kids all the time that are getting ready to go to SEAL training. And, you know, they'll write me, they'll call me. And, and when I was at the University of Texas, uh, you know, sometimes they'd want to go out to lunch and, and chat with me. And I had one young man who was a nationally ranked decathlete. I mean, he was in phenomenal shape. Uh, I mean, he was like six foot three, broad shoulders, small waist, you know, just a remarkable athlete. And he was getting, get, getting ready to go to SEAL training, asked if he could have lunch with me. So we went to the Headliners Club, one of the places here in Austin, and sat down. And, uh, and so we chatted for a little bit. And he, and he said, well, well, can I ask you some questions about SEAL training? I said, sure, of course. And he said, well, you know, he says, I want to know, uh, you know, do you think I need to run more uh, to get ready for SEAL training? I said, no. He said, okay, uh, how about, you know, more push-ups and more pull-ups? No. Well, what sh should I get better at swimming? No. And of course, he kind of went through and I could tell he was getting frustrated. And, uh, and finally, I said, look, getting through SEAL training is easy. You just don't quit. And he says, no, 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 I got all that. I said, no, I'm not sure you do. I said, the fact of the matter is, you know, it, when you go to SEAL training, you see folks, I had a kid in my class that was like a 401 miler in high school who didn't make it through. You find these folks that are phenomenal athletes that, that are, you know, you think are going to excel and they're like the first people to drop out. And yet the kids that have the perseverance, that never give up, that recognize that they're going to go through some tough times, but if they can just survive to the next evolution, the next event, th then, then they're one step closer. And so I think life and, and the business world is all like this. You know, no matter where you are, uh, whether you're, again, in the, in the, 
the corporate world or the academic world or the healthcare world or the athletic world, you're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, if you let those mistakes define you, if you let those mistakes scare you to the point where you're not ready to make the next tough decision, then you're never going to be a great leader. I mean, one of the things you learn uh, in combat uh, is this, this unfortunate fact that you're going to fail. Nothing steals you for combat quite like failure. Um, but if you fail in combat and you, you decide that you're too, too frightened to make the next tough decision, then the men and women that work for you, they will be underserved and not served well because they need you to make the ne next tough decision. That's what the expectation is. Well, this is about persevering. This is about never giving up. Uh, you know, you can give up physically, which happens a lot of times in SEAL training. You can give up kind of mentally. You just kind of get too tired. And you can give up spiritually. Uh, you know, just say, I I'm, I've, ju I've just had it. I can't do it anymore. Well, that's the easy way out. I mean, in my opinion, that's really the easy way. You can always find an excuse for giving up. Um, so, you know, if, if what you're doing is noble and honorable and worthwhile, then don't give up. Now, I'm not going to tell you stay in a bad marriage or a bad relationship or, you know, don't give up on your over drinking. I mean, you know, if it's bad behavior, give it up. But if it's something that's noble and worthwhile, just push through the tough times and don't give up. Excellent. All right. So now to the something extra. I'm always afraid that I'm going to ask, I'm going to have too many questions on my list and I'm not going to give our participants enough opportunity. So I think we're good today. Um, Admiral McRaven, you are credited for organizing and overseeing the execution of Operation Neptune Spear, the special ops raid that led to the killing of Osama bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011. What was going through your head prior to your men touching down on the ground? And what were you feeling after completion of the mission? Yeah, I think my answer uh, always surprises folks um, because there is this belief that, that to me it was this giant dramatic moment that there were timpani drums playing in the background as we came to this crescendo uh, and that, you know, you recognize the historical moment and, uh, and it was playing out like a movie, but it doesn't. Uh, it, it just doesn't work that way. The fact of the matter was it was, it was all business. Uh, we had we had built a plan. We had rehearsed the plan extensively. I had you know 162 phases in the plan. I had decision points uh, that that I had to make uh, when we got to certain points. So if, if the helicopter got compromised a quarter of the way into the flight, do you turn around? Yes or no? The answer is yes. You know if you get to halfway, uh, do you turn around? Yes or no? The answer is yes. You turn around. If you get to three quarters of the way there, now you're kind of committed. Now you have to move. What are the next steps? So everything was a business plan. And, and I, I mean, I hate to make that uh, analogy, but the fact of the matter is we went into great detail on the risks, how we reduce the risk to a manageable level, uh, and what are the decisions that I need to make, and what are the implications of those decisions? We had plan A, we had plan B, we had plan C, and we had plan D. And so, again, this is, I think, how you approach any difficult challenge. So as the mission is unfolding, uh, I'm not overly emotional. Uh, when the helicopter went down uh, in, the, uh, in the courtyard, I, I reverted to plan B. Uh, this was something we had anticipated, and therefore uh, we were ready to execute the next portion of the plan. When I got the word that, uh, that they had identified bin Laden on the target, this was the from the ground force commander came the, the call uh, for God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo. Geronimo had been the, uh, the call sign or the, the code word for bin Laden. But uh, I wasn't overly enthusiastic because the plan wasn't completed yet. I still needed to get the guys uh, off the target with the remains of bin Laden back uh, through 162 miles of Pakistan. And by this time, the Pakistanis were starting to alert aircraft. They figured out what was going on. So I still had a lot of work to do. Even after the guys got back, um, we still had to get bin Laden's body actually and go back into Pakistan because we had to fly down the air corridor in Pakistan to get to the Carl Vinson, the aircraft carrier, where we eventually uh, uh, buried, buried bin Laden at sea. But even after that, uh, I knew that there is always follow-up. 
uh, having been involved in, in big operations before, uh, whether that was the capture of Saddam Hussein or the rescue of Captain Phillips, it's never quite over. And I knew that, uh, you know, it is one of these ones where, you know, no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. You have to be careful about this, all of a sudden, this sense of, of exuberance and excitement, only to find that somebody is going to burst your bubble. Well, fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but I didn't know that. So, you know, two days later, I am back. Um, next day, I'm actually on a plane back to, to Capitol Hill. I'm briefing Capitol Hill. And, but then the conspiracy theory started to come out. Was Bin Laden really dead? Uh, did they really, you know, complete this mission? And yeah, you've, got to, you've got to fend off all of these, uh, these conspiracy theorists and, uh, and you have to put things, certain things to rest. So uh, to me, it was really all business. And I didn't really appreciate the magnitude of the mission. I mean, I understood the historic significance of it. Obviously, I was there and I had a chance to watch uh, the president come on, on TV that night. So that part wasn't naive to me, but it really wasn't, uh, or that part wasn't lost to me. But it really wasn't until November of that year, uh, I had gone to New York uh, to brief or to give a speech to 2,000 of New York's finest uh, cops and uh, first responders. And it was there that I realized the, the impact to New Yorkers uh, and, and frankly, uh, you know, to the broader American community. So it took a while before it really set in. But as far as the mission went, uh, we were all business and, and all business for uh, the mission. And I would offer for, you know, several days, weeks after that. Wow. Amazing. It's, it's incredible to hear it right from you. Um, what are you most proud of, Bill? And what, what would you like your legacy to be? Yeah, you know, your, your legacy is never about, you know, your ranks or the medals you wear on your chest. Uh, your legacy is about whether or not the men and women that work for you learn to respect you, whether you did right by them. Uh, so it, at the end of the day, if the, you know, the SEALs and the Rangers and the Green Berets and the, and the great Air Force and Marine officers and enlisted men and women that work for me, if they think I did a good job, that's the legacy, you know, you hope to leave. And I would offer the second part of that is you mentor a lot of young folks coming up, both officers and enlisted. And I've, I've been pleased to see that uh, the, the officers that, uh, that I helped mentor uh, in my time in the, in the military went on to do uh, and continue to go on to do good things. So your legacy is about whether or not you earn the respect of the troops uh, and, and who you mentor to carry the torch after you're gone. Excellent. My final question to you is if you could only give our MBAs and our MS business students one piece of advice, what would it be? Work hard. I, I think that uh, you know, people overestimate sometimes the value of talent, however you want to define talent. Uh, intellectual talent, physical talent, pick something. Uh, you know, it is great to have talented people working for you. But at the end of the day, I've found that hard work really can overcome a lot of shortfalls. Uh, I, I was by far and away not the best officer uh, that went through SEAL training. I wasn't the best officer when I, you know, got to my first team. And, uh, and I'm not sure I was the best officer throughout my career. But where I wasn't good, I made up for hard, in hard work. And, and the officers that I saw that really excelled, uh, they were incredibly hard workers. You know, when you get into a tough problem, I mean, when things really get challenging, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to break out the stubby pencil, uh, you know, put on a pot of coffee, as they say, and get to work. Work your way through the problem. Uh, you know, if you can have talent and hard work, Bingo. Uh, that's the best of all worlds. Uh, but more times than not, I, I haven't always seen those two qualities in a single individual. Uh, and when you do see it, it's magical. And, and there are folks out there that obviously have that. But I, I would offer, if you want to excel in business, uh, it's really a, a function of, you know, learning your business and working hard. And, and, work, and hard work will, uh, like I said, make up for whatever shortfalls you may have. And if you don't have any shortfalls, it'll just accelerate the talent that, uh, 
that you've got with you. Great advice, great advice. Excellent, so we'll now shift to our Q&A and we're, we're really fortunate we're gonna have 30 solid minutes of Q&A. So Ryan Staples asks you, what can we as business leaders do to make the best use of the skills that veterans will bring into the business world? The first thing uh, folks need to understand is that veterans have, have one quality that the military teaches them, and that is leadership. Uh, the second important quality is they know how to function in a team. But what they don't have are business skills. Back in 2005, uh, Wall Street was very gracious. They kind of opened up their doors uh, to, to veterans, to people that were transitioning out of the military. And they said, hey, come to Wall Street. Uh, you know, you can be in you know, a hedge fund, investment banker. You can do a whole lot of things on Wall Street. And we welcome veterans, particularly the officers. Um, but here's what happened. They found out that, you know, almost 75% of those folks did not succeed in business because Wall Street made a mistake and the veterans made a mistake. Wall Street assumed that because, you know, these, these folks were, you know, Naval Academy graduates or Air Force Academy graduates or West Point graduates, or they'd gone to, you know, the University of Texas or A&M, and then they had spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan, that somehow this was going to make them, you know, great, uh, you know, on Wall Street or in the business world. Well, it didn't. Like anything else, you have to learn the trade. Uh, so if you're going to be, you know, good at whatever you do, Hey, go, go to the May School of Business, go to McCombs, go to Wharton, go to pick something, but you have to learn the skill first. And then what you find out is that what the veterans have is, I mean, they're going to show up on time. They are going to work hard. They're going to be great team, uh, team players. And when given the opportunity, they will lead well. But if they don't have the skill set to do the job, uh, then it's going to be really challenging for them. For the veterans, what they've got to be able to do is make the transition to a different culture. They have to recognize coming into the corporate world that the culture is just not the same as the military. And if they expect to find that culture, they're going to be disappointed and their morale will take a hit and then their enthusiasm will take a hit. So the, the veterans, you know, where, where the business world uh, and the veterans need to come together is the business world needs to understand the veterans need training and the, the veterans need to understand they're about to step into you know, a new assignment that is unlike anything they've done before. Learn the business world, learn the culture, uh, and then you can apply the leadership skills and the teamwork that, uh, that you learned in the military to, to doing your job. Uh, but, but if you think you're gonna go into an organization uh, just because they're wearing suits and they have kind of a, a, a corporate mentality does not mean it's gonna be the same culture as you had in the military. Excellent. As a leader, what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn from it? <laughs> yeah. Where do I begin? <laughs> you know, uh, the, the list is, is awfully long. Um, yeah, biggest mistake. Um, you know, again, there were mistakes all the time. I don't know if I could call out one as the biz biggest mistake, but I will offer uh, something I talked about before. Uh, when, uh, uh, right before the bin Laden raid, uh, we had a mission that did not go well. And, and back to what I was saying earlier, you know, I, I went back and I played it over in my head again and again and again and again. Um, and, and frankly, it began to consume me a little bit. And, and I began to second guess myself. Well, when the bin Laden raid, when, uh, when the planning for this started, it, it was just me. Uh, me and, and one of the Navy captain who was kind of my, uh, my sidekick. But I, I, I had, didn't bring the SEALs in yet. I didn't bring any of the other planners in yet because the president hadn't made the decision to go with the raid. So for you know, three months, uh, it was just me making the plan, briefing the president. And, and this, this failed mission beforehand was weighing on me heavily. So the, the lesson that I learned, and it's not that I hadn't known it before, but back to the point about, look, you're going to make mistakes. You got to learn from those mistakes, but you can't be afraid to make the next tough decision. But as I was grappling with this uh, and wondering whether or not I had done all the appropriate preparation for the mission, I finally brought in some of my key um, enlisted and officers and my sergeant major, command sergeant major, who was the, 
senior enlisted guy on my staff, a, a great friend, a, a remarkable warrior. And I turned to him and I said, hey, uh, Sergeant Major, yeah, I need to tell you, I'm, I'm a little concerned about this. And he, and he kind of gave me that look and he said, hey, sir, you know, you made the right decisions on the last mission. You're making the right decisions now. Don't second guess yourself, you know, press forward. And I needed that reinforcement. So when I say what was the, you know, the biggest mistake I made, I would just offer that, you know, it's not necessarily the biggest mistakes you make in life. It's the kind of culmination of mistakes and you begin to lose confidence in, in your decisions and your ability to kind of move forward gets constrained. You gotta be careful about that. Again, you need to learn from your mistakes. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, you need to go back and do the forensics. Ask yourself, what could you have done better? But then the great leaders, even the good leaders, you've got to say, okay, I've learned from that. Now let's move forward and I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to be better next time. Excellent. Matt McGinnis asks, in the military, you're a leader from the rank of E5 onward, often from the rank of E3 or E4. In the civilian world, those chances to lead are not as prevalent. What, if any, groups or organizations can you recommend to young professionals to help build leadership throughout their life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, you can develop leadership skills in any organization, you know, you become part of. Intramural sports. Uh, this may sound a little silly, but everybody knows that in intramural sports, uh, you know, if you're you're going to be the quarterback or you're going to be, you know, the linebacker on a football team, or you're going to be the point guard on a basketball team, your opportunity to lead that team uh, is, uh, is pretty obvious to the other members of the team. In your church, if you're going to be, you know, a member of the choir, uh, in your fraternal organization, wherever it is, there are ample opportunities in the civilian world to lead. Uh, you just have to put yourself in a leadership position. A lot of times people join organizations and they let others lead because uh, maybe they don't want to put too much effort into it. Maybe they're afraid about their leadership because they haven't had an opportunity. But if you want to be a good leader, put yourself in leadership positions. You will make mistakes. You will fail. People will criticize you. Guess what? Welcome to leadership. Uh, so find every opportunity you can, you know, again, in social organizations and faith organizations and intramural organizations in, in school organizations, you can always find some place to lead. Jump in and lead. And if you make a mistake, learn from it and find another opportunity to lead again. Excellent. Vivian Ramirez asks, what is your all-time favorite book? And what is the book that has impacted your leadership ethos the most? Hey, Richard, I think I'm back. I'm not sure where I lost yep. you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let me read it again. No problem. Uh, what is your all-time favorite book? And what is the book that has impacted your leadership ethos the most? Yeah. Um, well, I, I am a man of faith. So uh, yeah, my, my all-time favorite book, of course, is, is the Holy Bible, uh, which I keep on my nightstand and, and refer to it often. Uh, but aside from that, uh, you know, again, as you look behind me, uh, there's, there's all sorts of books. So it, it would depend on the area. In the military, my favorite book is Carl von Clausewitz's On War. And uh, it is the seminal book on war. I, I found it to be incredibly helpful when I was thinking through strategic issues uh, when I was a senior officer. So if you're in the military, I don't care what rank you're at, you ought to read Clausewitz's book on war. Now, it's pretty thick. Um, but it is, it is, it is vastly uh, important. You know, I, there's a, a little book out there called The Speed of Trust uh, by Stephen Covey. And, and I like The Speed of Trust because it's, it's got kind of two fundamental principles to it. Uh, it. It talks about what does it take to build trust in someone? And, uh, and it says, look, there's two things. First, you have to have a personal relationship. And so, you know, you, you can have a personal relationship with your brother, brother-in-law, but you also have to be able to deliver on your promises. So, you know, you could love your brother-in-law and you could trust your brother-in-law, but if you give your brother-in-law a job or a task and he doesn't complete it, you lose trust in your brother-in-law. So organizations fundamentally have these two components, business organizations in particular. Uh, 
You have to have a personal relationship with the leadership of that corporation, but they've got to deliver or you lose trust in them. Well, this is frankly no different in, in the military or in academia or in healthcare. Uh, trust is an important factor in, uh, you know, in, in developing uh, you know, a plan for moving forward. Yeah, I, there are, I mean, I'm also a big, uh, you, you asked something about me that people don't know. I, I love philosophy. Uh, I'm a bit of an amateur philosopher uh, with an emphasis on amateur. Um, <laughs> but about half my bookshelf over here is, uh, is, on, uh, is on philosophy. And, and I, I like everything from, uh, from Descartes to Kant to Nietzsche uh, and all of those books. While I don't agree with a lot of the philosophers, uh, those books kind of help shape my thinking uh, when you're having to deal with, uh, with deep issues. That's excellent. Uh, Craig Rezaev uh, asks, did you ever feel anxious before first day of SEAL training, leading big operations, or speaking in front of UT graduates? What is your advice to calm yourself and remain focused during high stress events? Yeah, I, I don't want this response to sound too self-serving, um, but I, I had you know a fair amount of confidence in my athletic ability when I went to SEAL training, so I wasn't overly nervous about uh, about going to SEAL training. Uh, I was uh, I was a good athlete. I was in good shape. Uh, I, I felt ready for SEAL training. I didn't know anything about it. You know, this was 1977, so I graduated from UT in uh, uh, May of '77, and I started SEAL training in late July, I think. Um, but but I had been uh, probably in the best shape of my life. So I, I was excited about going, but I didn't know anything about SEAL training because back then there were no movies, no books, no nothing. You showed up. In fact, I wasn't even sure I was showing up at the right place initially. <laughs> so uh, I, I was pretty confident going into SEAL training. Uh, in terms of, uh, of you know, you know, your life in, in combat, uh, sure, you're, you're nervous or you're scared uh, every single day. Every time I got on a helicopter uh, to fly around the mountains of Afghanistan or to fly from uh, you know, Balad to Bagram, you're scared. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being scared. You just can't let the fear control you. So the one thing you learn, whether you're standing up in front of 10,000 people uh, to give a speech or whether you're in combat, you have to learn to control your fear. And, and that comes from experience. That comes from you know, getting up and doing it again and again and again. In combat, you know, you take that fear and you, you put it as far down as you can and you put as many barriers around it as you can and you try not to allow that fear to come out and, uh, and drive your actions. But it's always there. It's always there and, uh, and you've just got to be able to overcome it. So there, there's no, you know, no magic, uh, magic pill that can, that can keep you from being afraid or nervous. You just have to learn to deal with it, and everybody kind of deals with it differently. Yeah, I was fortunate because uh, I, I was generally pretty confident in my skill set, uh, but that doesn't keep you from being afraid. I'll tell you, I, I could listen to your war stories all day. <laughs> uh, Charlotte asks, and you might have sort of already talked a little bit about this, when not put in a leadership position in the military and out, what are some ways to still be a leader? You know, great leaders are also great followers. There's this, uh, yeah, I think people forget that you know, when you're in a leadership position, there are also leaders in the people that you are working with that step forward and follow you when others may not. And if you can be a good follower, if you can ask the right questions, if you can make sure you're comfortable with the plan that people are moving forward, if you can mobilize the people that are around you, the other followers, then you become as good a leader as you are a follower. But every great leader needs great followers. And it is not easy to be a great follower. I had a chance to talk to the West Point, uh, the, at West Point in, their, in between their junior and senior year, they have what's called the 500th night meaning there's only 500 days left before they get commissioned. And it's a big kind of gala event uh, for all the juniors at West Point. And I was honored to, to get.
I'm sorry, Richard, I'm back. I'm not sure where I dropped off again. No worries, no worries. You dropped off when you were talking about the gala event. Yeah, so um, so at, at this event, it's, it's all the juniors at West Point and, uh, and their uh, significant others that, that join the event. And, and I told the young cadets, I said, look, when you get in to, uh, you know, your platoon or your company or your battalion, you look up at the leader sometimes and it's always easy to be overly righteous, to think you're smarter than the man or woman that's leading you, uh, to be too cynical about the people that are above you. Uh, and I think you have to be very, very careful about that. I remember when I was a young SEAL, the SEAL leadership we had, they had come out of Vietnam. Uh, they were, you know, a little bit uh, older and, uh, and, and tired in some ways. And sometimes the junior officers would kind of, you know, laugh about them behind their back or they'd point out their, uh, you know, their little idiosyncrasies. Uh, and, and that is not a healthy thing for any organization. And what you need to do is, as a follower, when you see that happening, you got to stop it. Uh, because invariably, the men and women that are leading are there for a reason. Uh, they got there because they worked hard. They got there because they proved something uh, that put them in that position of leadership. I always told folks, uh, when I took a, a new job, the man or woman before you was not an idiot. So when you see a challenge and you say, well, I can solve that. You got to be careful about that. The person before you tried to solve that as well, and they struggled. Um, so again, this idea of followership uh, is important. Learning how to be a good follower, learning how to be professional in your dealing with, uh, with your boss, learning how to motivate the other teammates that are with you uh, to, again, follow the leader. That's, that's real leadership. Excellent. Suzanne Spera asks, how do you handle confrontation? and get your way, so to speak, without <laughs> confrontation, what types of strategies have you used? Well, the great thing about the, about the military is because you have a hierarchy, um, you know, the, the confrontation, you do have confrontation, make no mistake about it. Uh, the, the, the great thing I do like about the military is that you can have uh, a, a serious conversation uh, and in fact, the expectation in the special operations community is before you go out on a mission, uh, you know, you're, you from the, the army captain in the Rangers leading the mission to the private, uh, I mean, people are going to talk about this. They're going to get a chance to, to express their concerns. But once the, once the decision is made, everybody kind of salutes smartly and moves out. And then when they come back from a mission, boy, everybody gets a chance to kind of tear apart the goods and the bads of the mission so that frankly, they'll be better prepared when they go on the next mission. But confrontation is, again, it's a, that's a part of leadership. You have to figure out how you're going to deal with, uh, with frankly, with, with disgruntled employees, with disgruntled uh, colleagues, and, and obviously with disgruntled superiors. I've always found that listening uh, and, and trying to kind of put myself in their shoes is always helpful. So when somebody comes up and, uh, and is mad about you at something, you know, the first thing you do is you, you tend to want to get defensive. But wait a second, you know, uh, and I knew what I was doing or I did this right. And boy, sometimes you just have to take a deep breath and you have to say, okay, were they right or not? And if you can do that, and if you can try to think clearly through what they're saying, even if they're kind of yelling at you, or even if they're, they're being a little too aggressive, if you, if you can get past that and determine whether or not their points are valid, that allows you to kind of deal with that confirmation, uh, that, that confrontation a little easier. But sometimes you just have to stand your ground as well. If you think you're right, um, and, and you think that, uh, that you need to press forward, you just have to stand your ground. But I'm also a people person. Uh, and, and sometimes it's helpful to be a people person. I, back to, you know, what did you learn growing up? Well, I learned to, to respect people. My father and my mother, uh, I mean, they made, it, they made it crystal clear to me that, that I had a responsibility to respect everyone, you know, in, in, unless they uh, were, were patently disrespectful to me. And that respect allows you to, again, view people in a little bit of a different light. And when people know that you respect them, even if you, you know, don't agree with their, with their position, they're much more likely to come around uh, to your way of thinking, uh, or together you'll figure out a new route. Excellent. Great advice. William Muldoon asks, Bill, can you compare and contrast your leadership in the Navy versus working with UT? Yeah, 
Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. When I was uh, the chancellor, I got asked that question almost every time I did a town hall with the alumni or, or faculty. And it would always be kind of posed like this. They would say, well, chancellor, you know, when you were in the military, you know, you just told people what to do and they did it. Uh, but now, you know, you're working in academia and you got these kind of eccentric faculty and all this. I, I would stop and I'd say, look, if you think that when you were in the military, you just told people what to do and they did it, then you never spent a day in the military. Uh, you know, the military was as much about inspiring and motivating and managing the troops as it is, as it was when I was the chancellor. The one thing that, uh, that I learned in the military and the first thing that I applied when I became the chancellor was to understand the culture of higher education and healthcare. When I was getting ready to come into the job, uh, I met with uh, the woman who was uh, essentially my executive officer. And I didn't know her well at the time. And I said, uh, I said, Jana, I said, uh, you know, are, are people concerned about, you know, me coming in to take the, on the job as a chancellor? And she paused for a minute and, and she finally said, uh, well, yes, sir, they, uh, they are. And I said, uh, okay, why are they? She said, well, you know, for one, they know you're going to bring your people in uh, because, you know, every new chancellor coming in, they kind of bring their people. <laughs> I laughed. I said, yeah, I don't have any people. You are my people. <laughs> said, you know, the, the people aren't coming from the military to join me here. You are my people. And she goes, okay. She said, well, you know, I mean, we know that, you know, you've spent 37 years in the, in the Navy. And, uh, and so there was this kind of expectation that we were all going to be like marching around and saluting each other and ringing bells on the quarter deck. I said, no, that's, that's not kind of the way it works. I said, the fact of the matter is, I need to understand how you do business in higher education. I need to understand how healthcare works. I want to understand, tell me what a chair of a department does. What does a dean do? What does a provost do? What's the, what are the roles and responsibilities of the president? How does formula funding work? Explain to me everything I need to know uh, about, uh, about higher education. And once you begin to understand the culture, then you can apply the leadership skills that you, you know to be, frankly, fungible. And this is one of the things. Even in the world of, of higher education, the faculty, the administrators, the students, they want somebody to make the hard decisions. They don't want these decisions to languish. Uh, I was fortunate when I came to UT, uh, we were right in the middle uh, of, of two kind of hot button issues. And the first one was uh, guns on campus, uh, campus carry. And, uh, and I came out very early on, a reporter asked me about campus carry and I said, no, I, I don't support it. And of course, this, <laughs> this created a, a bit of a, of a fury. Uh, or you know, brouhaha, because one, there were a lot of people in Texas thought that uh, campus carry should go forward. And I said, look, I've been shot at before. I, I don't really think we need more guns on campus. Uh, the, the, uh, that immediately endeared me to the faculty. Uh, and then the other issue was, uh, was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the dreamers. Uh, I said, look, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time. I grew up in Texas. Uh, I've watched these young men and women who came over when they were two or three years old be educated within the public school system. Now they're going to our great universities. And so I supported the Dreamers, also something that wasn't necessarily popular with, with other parts of, uh, of the folks in Texas. But, but these were decisions that I thought needed to be made for what were the best interests of the university. So learn to make you know, the hard decisions, but also you have to get down and be, spend time with the troops. Uh, I mean, I traveled all over the place. I, I would go to all the institutions. I would talk to the faculty. I would talk to the students, just like I did when I was in the military. Uh, you have to understand. You have to listen back to. You have to set high standards. You have to give the presidents and the administrators the tools and the resources and the latitude to do their job and then hold them accountable when they don't do their job. Uh, it, it was Leadership 101. It served me well in the military, and it served me well as a chancellor. Excellent. We have time, I think, for just a couple more questions. Um, Karina asks, what would you say to CEOs and other senior business leaders, hiring managers, that may have hesitations about hiring military veterans because their perception of military leadership is influenced by movies where they see drill sergeant-like management? <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, and that is a, a perception that is, is genuine. There are people out there that, that nowadays, of course, they've got other perceptions. They are, they are concerned that if you spent time in combat, that you are somehow broken uh, because they see a lot of the, 
uh, the stories of PTS and TBI and, and they're concerned that the veterans are coming and somehow, uh, again, they're going to be broken individuals. The one thing I am quick to point out to CEOs is, look, war changes you. Make no mistake about it. Uh, everybody that goes to war or everybody that serves during a time of crisis is going to be changed. Uh, but I will tell you, most of those people are, are resilient, and resilience is an important characteristic, I think, for any CEO. The other thing that most CEOs know is if you're in the military, you have this sense of duty. Uh, and by duty, I mean you're going to show up on time, you're going to work hard, uh, you're going to, again, be a good team player. Uh, and, and that is one of the characteristics and one of the traits that, that is apparent, frankly, to most of the CEOs I've met. So while there is clearly, uh, with some of the CEOs, there is a perception out there that we are all drill sergeants. I think just like uh, you know, my staff was concerned that because I had spent 37 years in the military, that somehow we, you know, we were all gonna have to be saluting each other, marching around, being a little facetious, as you know. Um, but, but they thought I was gonna be a little bit too, too uh, rigid, I think. Um, so, so there is certainly that perception. But I think that's just a function of you as the individual veteran coming in, you can allay those fears immediately when you sit down with whoever is hiring you and show them that you have learned about the company, that you're flexible enough, uh, that you're willing to be part of this culture, uh, and that you're going to work hard. And then that will dispel all those, uh, those negative myths. Excellent. Kate Wynn, one of our MS Business students, asks, Adam Wormer Craven, how do you find encouragement when you felt spiritually, emotionally exhausted? And she says, thank you so much for speaking to us. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You know, I was, uh, rarely was I discouraged. It did happen. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to tell you it didn't happen. There were times when I was discouraged, but most of the time, I was inspired by the, by the young soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and again, some great civilians out there that worked for me. And so when you're discouraged, all you have to do is, you know, all I had to do was kind of get out of my office and go talk to some soldier sitting on the, you know, the, the guard desk and, and find out their story and find out how, how excited they were to, to be helping out on something. So Whenever I had, uh, had problems with my own morale, I immediately would get down and talk to the, the troops or the employees. That same thing happened at the University of Texas, you know? I always found the reason I loved spending time around the faculty was that they were so passionate about, uh, you know, what they wanted to teach their students, or they were so passionate about the research they were doing. Uh, and, and sometimes when I got, uh, you know, down in the dumps a little bit, and I would, I would get out of my office, I'd go visit, one of the schools, you know, you talk to the students who are, you know, the, the Rio Grande Valley was always fun for me because you saw these, uh, these, these incredible young Hispanic kids that were about to change everything about their life and the lives of generations of their family to come because they were going to school and they were going to be successful. I mean, <laughs> if you can't get inspired by stories like that, uh, then, then you don't have a heart. And so, uh, I, and I found the same thing in the military. When, when we had a bad mission, when things didn't go well, I'd spend time with the troops and, and they helped fire me up. So, you know, in, in, this, in this kind of day and age we're living through, uh, I, I tell folks, and I think they're surprised by it, I am the biggest fan of the millennials and the Gen Z you'll ever meet. This narrative that somehow the millennials are these, you know, soft, entitled little snowflakes well, then I'm quick to point out you've never seen him in a firefight in Afghanistan, or you've never seen him trying to go to school somewhere in Texas to make a better life for themselves. Uh, this is a great generation. Uh, they're different than, than my baby boomer generation, but they are so much better in so many ways. They are more inclusive. They ask the hard questions. They mobilize when, uh, when they don't like something. And, and while I may not agree on a lot of the issues they mobilize on, they're not afraid to do that. They're not afraid to kind of confront the issues of the day. And so as we are going through this, this pandemic, as we are going through this kind of social upheaval, these are gonna to be tough, tough times. I'm convinced we're gonna come out of it and actually be stronger as a result of it. And I believe that because I've spent time with the young men and women that are going to make us better at the end of this. So if you have those days, yeah, go talk to your students, go talk to your friends and colleagues that are trying to uh, to make their way in life, and, uh, and that generally perks you up. Excellent. 
I think that's a really good, that's a really good one. I think to end on, I, I want to be so respectful of your time and we're so grateful again for having you today and for you joining us. Um, make sure to know, uh, Bill, I'm, I'm at your beck and call if you need anything, my friend. Um, and, and again, really just thank you for joining um, us all at Mays Business School and at Texas A&M today. We've had, we had over 250 on to, to listen to you and I'm sure they, they all left very inspired um, and very grateful as well. So thank you again. Yeah, well, thanks, Richard. Let me, uh, let me thank all of you. This is, uh, this is a great time in your life. Uh, and, and I know these are difficult times, uh, and I know, you know your future at this point in time may seem a little uncertain. Uh, as I said, I'm confident we're going to get through this. Uh, we're going to learn new things about uh, how we do business. We're going to learn new things about you know, how we function as a society. Uh, but at the end of the day, we will come out stronger. I'm not, again, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be an easy road, uh, but we'll be stronger as a result of it. And I think the business enterprise, after we go through this kind of cataclysmic event uh, will also uh, turn out to be very prosperous and you'll find, uh, you'll find your path forward uh, looks brighter than you anticipated. So best of luck to, uh, to all of you out there. Thank you. Thank you so much again. There, there's been a couple people typing in. Would you please consider running for president? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks again, folks. I appreciate it. Y'all take care. Thank you so Thank much. You I much, really sir. appreciate it. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you.